actually the wicked man is doing more effort to destroy his own soul than the righteous man does to uh, secure his soul unto eternal life. Turn to Psalm 9. Psalm 9 is uh, clearly a song of praise. And remember that the Psalms in Hebrew are called the Tehillim, the songs of praise. And Psalm 9 is a prime example of that. The title says to the chief musician, the tune to the tune of the death of the son. Psalm of David. The death of the sun, of course, it rings all kinds of uh, bells maybe, but um, this was actually a popular melody known in David's days. It's called um, Muth Laben. And some suggest uh, that it refers to an instrument on which this melody was played. But um, others think that it has to do with uh, the title itself, so it's the death of of, uh, of the son was the death of a champion who went out between the camps, which uh, reminds us, of course, of Goliath. Apart from that, the psalm also has um, something else, and that is that it is acrostic. And we've spoken about this in the past. We find it in many instances in scripture. Acrostic means that the first letters of each verse or each paragraph, each, each sentence, these first letters form a new message or word um, and um, in this way there is uh, in many places in scripture there is uh, an extra layer of information you can say and we find the acrostic um, coding in uh, quite a few psalms and psalm 9 is the first one and the first letters of each um, sentence form uh, follow the hebrew alphabet so it begins with the aleph the beth gimel dalet etc um, and Psalm 9 covers in this way the first half of the Hebrew alphabet, whereas Psalm 10 follows the second half. And so for that reason, uh, some think that um, these two psalms are actually one psalm, one song. So for example, in Catholic Bibles, you will find this as one psalm, whereas in the Protestant and Hebrew Bibles, uh, is, they are recorded as two separate psalms. Now this acrostic was, um, was helpful in memorizing the, the psalms because you knew, if once you knew the alphabet in this case, um, you, could, uh, you knew at least the letter with which each uh, verse started. And so this was uh, a tool that was being used for the spiritual training of children. So what is it about? Well, as I said, it's a song of praise and um, it begins um, in verses 1 and 2 by praising God for his greatness. What we see, and we can clearly see it in the, uh, in the schematic uh, that I made, the, the first major part is praising God and praising God for three things. And so it begins by praising him for his greatness, then for how he deals with the enemy, and then for how he treats the oppressed. So it starts with praising God for his greatness in verses 1 and 2. It says there, And I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will shew forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. David praises the Lord, and he does so, in his own words, with his whole heart, wholeheartedly. Um, we often ask things of God, or we complain to God, uh, we plea of Him, but how often do we actually praise Him with our lips? And when we do it, do we do it wholeheartedly? Now, uh, you would say, oh, I do this every, uh, every week in church, we sing songs of praise, hands in the air, eyes closed, and... Uh, goes on for a long time so yes praise the lord with my lips a lot um, yeah i hope uh, it is truly so um, but what i've uh, observed is that um, and not just me but is that um, 
this is often um, a way of pleasing oneself. Uh, it's it's um, it's pleasant to be in this kind of um, atmosphere and uh, even trance, I would say. Um, and it's often pleasing um, pleasing self instead of uh, praising God uh, with um, nice music, music that has certain. Uh, Attributes, and I'll not go into all of this now, but and lots of repetitions, vain repetitions often. So we have to be um, sure what we are actually doing and why we are doing it. But David praises God with his whole heart by telling of all his great works, he says, remembering and telling the great things that God has done is a wonderful way to praise him. This is what you see in more traditional uh, hymns um, and the Psalms itself that uh, praise God. They, they have actually content. They speak about the marvelous things that God has done. Instead of just repeating um, yeah, often hollow phrases. Um, another thing is that uh, it's often so that when Christians get together, um, they seldom speak of God. They speak about a lot of things, and uh, maybe politics, uh, um, sports, uh, news events, all kinds of things, family, the weather, uh, but they don't speak about God so much, or not even at all. And <clears throat> we've experienced this often. And uh, one wonders why. Well, the reason why is because they don't have anything to say about God. They don't have anything to say about God. Because actually they're not really involved with God. But David is, and he speaks about the marvelous works of God. The marvelous works, the Hebrew word there, is uh, pala. I'll write it down. Pala is written like this. Pala is a word that we find uh, frequently in the Psalms. And um, it, uh, it is used for basically three main things. For the great redemptive miracles that God has done. So we're talking about great things that everyone um, can actually see and read about. But it also speaks, uh, it's also used when it speaks about uh, the daily experiences in our lives. Things that we, that are important to us, that we experience, but that maybe are meaningless to others. And thirdly, it's, be, it's used when it speaks about the wondrous things in Scripture. And that should not be underestimated. So telling of God's great works is one way to praise God. Another way is by rejoicing in Him. That's what he mentions in verse 2. Finding and expressing gladness and joy in the goodness and greatness and kindness of God and celebrating it. And the third way he mentions to praise God is to sing praise to his name. He is the Most High. Now then David changes from praising uh, God for his greatness to praising God for how he deals with the enemy. Verse 3. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou settest in the throne, judging right. With these words, David acknowledges that it was God who defeated his enemies. It is good to count our blessings and to recognize the hand of God in them and in our lives and to praise him for it. God had maintained David's right hand and cause. This shows us another thing, which is maybe very apt at this uh, point in time. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine why, looking at what's going on in Israel at uh, this uh, moment. One cannot automatically claim that God is uh, on our side in battles or disputes. Um, actually, uh, Man may think that God is on their side when he is not. God may, may not be on either side, uh, especially when um, 
when the respective party is not walking in the will of God. So instead of um, assuming that God is uh, on, uh, on our side, we should actually attempt to be on God's side. And we do that by obeying him. Now in verse 5, David then shows that he's thinking beyond himself and beyond his own situation, even beyond Israel. He speaks of the nations. And although uh, it's past tense, we could say uh, that it is prophetic perfect. That's not a, a grammatical term, but um, let's call it a, a biblical um, uh, biblical grammar. Prophetic perfect. He speaks of the same things as um, Psalm 2 does, He's, uh, where he says he sits on his thrones and judges the nations. He defeats his enemies. He continues then in verse 6, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Now the past tense switches here to future. Making clear that it is indeed prophetic. We can and we should praise God for what he has done. But... We can also praise him for what he is going to do, for it is a surety. David was looking forward to God ruling all the nations. And a thousand years later, Paul would quote the same words on Mars Hill in Athens. And we read about that in Acts 17, verse 31, where it says, He hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in uprightness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. It's clearly speaking about Jesus, that man whom he has raised from the dead. And it is speaking, of course, about the millennial reign that we can read of in Revelation chapter 20. And here we are, 2,000 years after Paul spoke these words, and over 3,000 years after David penned the, the same words, and we are on the brink of this to be fulfilled. Praise the Lord indeed. Then David switches from praising the Lord for how he deals with the enemy to praising the Lord for how he treats the oppressed. In verse 9, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. God is a refuge for the oppressed, especially in times of trouble, when all hope seems lost. And that doesn't just happen uh, like that, but it is because God's people know his name, it says. And that really means they have a relationship with him. And it's expressed here in three different ways. Uh, first of all, just that, they know your name. They have a relationship. Knowing the name in 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 the Bible, you can say, uh, knowing the name means knowing the person, having a relationship. Um, second thing that is mentioned, they trust in you. This means they have faith. And thirdly, they seek you. That means they invest time and effort in the relationship. And that is actually the only way to sustain a relationship. He continues then in verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. David invites others to praise God along with him. First and foremost by declaring his deeds. Praise God because he remembers the humble and the oppressed. He even avenges their blood. Scripture declares that the life is in the blood and it's only for God to give or take. And when man takes that right, God demands it back. The blood of Abel was crying to God from the earth. And in Numbers 35, uh, we read that uh, the blood of the unavenged murders pollutes the earth. In 2 Kings 9, we read that God had seen the blood of Nabal 
and seeks retribution. God has promised to avenge blood and remembers the murdered. And that should make those who seek to shed blood think twice. It's not a small thing. David continues in verse 13. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may shew forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. David had just considered that God remembered the cry of the humble, and now he wants God to remember him in his time of trouble. He realizes that it's only God who can change his destiny from entering the gates of death to entering the gates of the daughter of Zion, also known as the New Jerusalem. And that is a beautiful, poetic, but realistic uh, contrast that he paints here. It's either the gates of death or it's the gates, gates of the New Jerusalem. Like Abraham uh, and, and uh, the other patriarchs, David was also looking forward to this new city, this future city. He knew it, he would see it. The end goal is, uh, however, not for David's safety. The end goal is to glorify God even more because he says to rejoice in thy salvations. Also a profound statement. Thy salvations, the salvations of Yahweh is Yahoshua. That's literally what he's saying. And um, yes, we also long to rejoice in the salvation, to rejoice in Jesus in the new Jerusalem. It continues then in verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own food taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Hegeon Selah. There is something as divine retribution, and we pointed that also out in Psalm 7, verse 15 and 16. But no matter what, there is nothing that a wicked man does that is not against his own interest. Actually, the wicked man is doing more effort to destroy his own soul than the righteous man does to uh, secure his soul unto eternal life. And that's ironic, obviously. And yes, David knew that his enemies were often ensnared in the same trap that they set for others. He even saw it with his own son, Absalom, which is um, another interesting um, interesting thing regarding the, the title of this psalm, eh? the death of the, to the tune of the death of the son. And he adds to this statement here, Hegeon. And that's an interesting word, um, which we could read as uh, make no mistake about it, or uh, or think about it, or you let her bet it sink in. Uh, and um, uh, it is uh, it is a term that we also saw in the title of Psalm seven, uh, where we translated it with uh, with meditation. Uh, so think about it, meditate about it. Uh, yeah, let it sink in, indeed. Uh, some say it's a, it's a musical um, term, uh, resounding music, and it could be that as well uh, for the same purpose, to let it sink in. Um, and, and music can, of course, also um, serve that purpose. In the last uh, part of the psalm, uh, David speaks about the righteous judgment of God. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Again, there is a beautiful poetic contrast here. And the contrast is that the wicked try to forget God, whereas the needy and the poor are not forgotten by God. So, As we get to the end of the psalm, we think of the end of the wicked, the ultimate destruction in hell. 
the wicked are not just a few exceptions. It is actually the world, the nations, as it says here. They are those that try and choose to forget God. It is the godless world we live in. And the needy may feel they are forgotten, but they will not always feel that way. Obviously, David is not speaking of the needy and the poor in general, because many of them belong to the forgetters of God, of this world. But it is about those whose expectation is from the Lord. Their deliverance may be delayed, but they are not forgotten. Verse 19. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. It's easily perceived here that um, David prays for the judgment of the nations, for justice to be done. But really he prays for God to reach the nations through the display of his judgment. That those that choose to forget God may yet come to know his name. He has been praying, praising God um, in the first part of the psalm and he wishes for all to know and praise God. And we should echo that prayer too. It's one soul at a time until all have entered the ark. And that day will be upon us soon. And God will make himself known to all, even in his judgment. Ezekiel 38 verse 23 says, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. But even then, many will choose to forget him to their own demise. Let's pray with David that God may show man that he is just man. Amen. Amen.